Welcome to everybody. So glad that you're tuning in to Faith Bridge Live once again. So you remember that scene in Mark chapter four, where the disciples of Jesus are sailing across the Sea of Galilee in a boat, and all of a sudden a frightening storm descends upon them, and it's rocking the boat back and forth, tossing them to and fro. They're fearing for their lives. And where is Jesus? You remember where Jesus was? He's down at the bottom of the boat, and he's taking a nap just sawing logs, and one of the disciples goes down and gets him and says, Jesus, get up. Do you see what's happening to us? And Jesus gets up and he speaks to the wind and says, peace, be still, and things grow calm. And I remember I used to wonder, why, why did Jesus do that? Well, I think for one reason, he, he knew he held all power in his hands. But I think for the sake of the disciples, it was for another reason that he did it. He knew that, um, well, it's sort of like muscles. Muscles don't get strong overnight, right? And sometimes never. Muscles have to be tested and tried. Plates of weight have to be added to the bar and pressed or pulled if those muscles are going to grow. And I think it's because Jesus knew that his disciples had a faith like a muscle that was gonna to have to be tested and tried and developed and grown if there was going to be chiseled into their souls an inner fortitude that would be able to sustain them when he returned to the Father. And so, <clears throat> Throughout the Gospels, you see him in various scenes uh, testing them, putting a little more weight on the bar. Sometimes they come through reasonably well. Other times they flop. All the while, though, Jesus is keeping an eye on this timeline. And that timeline being he knew the end of three years, it's going to be in your hands because I'm going to return to the Father. And that's why in a different scene, the night that he was betrayed at the Last Supper, we talked about it last week. I want to look at it again a little bit right now. It's as if he's, he's taken two of those big 45-pound plates and he's putting them on the bar here at the end. And he says a really interesting verse. It's the verse I want us to focus on in our time. You'll find it in John 16, 33. Just the B part, the second part of the verse. Let me read it to you. It says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I think there's three observations that I would like for us to see in the next few minutes. So if you're a note taker, here's the first one. First thing he's saying is on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Why was he telling the disciples this? Because he knew what you and I deep down know, but we tend to forget. And that is that we live in a fallen world. Oh, the last week or two, the fallenness of this world has become all the more real to us again. We live in this fallen world. That's not how it was created. No, it was created as a heaven on earth without sin, without death, without suffering, without pain and destruction and evil. But what happened? Our spiritual parents, Adam and Eve, shook their fists at God. And they said, we'll have it our way, not your way, God. And they rebelled against his plan. And at that moment everything broke and sin and destruction and evil and pain and suffering all came gushing in. But we mustn't be too critical of Adam and Eve because the truth of the matter is in our own shape, forms, and fashions, every one of us who's ever come along has followed in their footsteps and played our own part in breaking the world further with our thoughts, sometimes with our words, sometimes with our actions to other people. And subsequently, Jesus was right when he said, 
This is a fallen world. On this world, in this earth, you're going to have many trials and sorrows. I think many of us have been lulled into sleep here in the Western com uh, culture, especially in the recent uh, years. Somehow, maybe errantly coming to think that suffering and adversity, those are reserved for you know, the, the disobedient people, the rebellious people, the faithless people, the bad people. Those are the, the people that they are the ones who have to suffer. <laughs> but remember, who was Jesus saying this to? He was saying it to his disciples, his innermost circle, his faithful ones, the ones who had gone with him those three years in ministry. <laughs> not the bad people, not the enemies of Jesus. No, he was saying it to his own. And he would say it to us as well today telling his followers, hey, remember, on this earth you will have trials and you will have sorrows. That's just how it works in a fallen world. So our question really shouldn't be, but why me? Why is this happening to me? But rather, why not me? If we're part of the human predicament, all of us are. You remember that scene in the old classic film, The Princess Bride, where Wesley and Buttercup are talking and Buttercup says to Wesley, you mock my pain. And then Wesley says to Buttercup, Highness, life is pain. And anyone who tells you differently is selling you something. <laughs> and I think his theology was actually quite right. It's true. On this earth, we are going to face hard things. And it's nothing new. The believers, century after century, all the way up to the present tense, have had to navigate that themselves. I'm sure you probably have seen an email that I've seen floating around a lot in the last week or two, penned by the Oxford Don C.S. Lewis, who more than 70 years ago uh, was writing to his felon, fellow Englanders uh, words to help comfort them and help them navigate the fears and the apprehensions that they were wrestling through in the era now of the atomic bomb. And in the interest of time, I'll just paraphrase what he says. He says, look at you. You're all consumed. You're all worried about the atomic bomb. But what, I'll, what about all the people who lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year? Or consider those who lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might cut out your throat. And what about those already navigating cancer and air raids in the war and railway accidents and motor accidents, car accidents? In other words, he was saying, hey, we're not the first people to go through some trials and tribulations. And Jesus had told us as much. In this world, you will have trials and tribulations. So I think it shouldn't surprise us, right, when we feel some of that more acutely as we have been in the recent days. It shouldn't surprise us, but it does hurt. Can't deny that, and I won't deny it. As a pastor, I read the the prayers that come in, I read your notes that you send in or email in, and my shoulders have felt heavy. My heart has been sad. I've read many notes of people saying, pray for our small business, we're worried. We don't have that many weeks of savings. We, 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 this is a very frightening thing. When is normalcy going to return? 
what I wish I could tell them. It hurts to see um, children <laughs> in our home and probably your home who are like, when can we just go back to normal and not really being able to tell them a concrete answer? It hurts to hear that some of our pilots based here in the hub of Houston have just been told your flights have been canceled by 50% and your salary has been cut by 50%. It hurts to see and to hear from some of our beautiful young brides and our dashing grooms who've been planning beautiful picturesque weddings for this spring and early summer whose plans are now seeming to go down, 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 and they're wondering, are we even gonna get our, our deposits back from vendors? It hurts to hear from my church planters all around who like small businesses are like, we don't have much savings and we use schools every week and now we can't get into the schools and we're really afraid. It hurts to see oil prices plummeting, especially in this city of Houston where that really matters. It hurts to see our stock market taking a bloodbath. Maybe it shouldn't surprise us, but it does hurt. As a matter of fact, several days ago, I was just feeling so, I don't know, heavy hearted, kind of cooped up. Um, it was having, still am, more Zoom meetings and go to meeting meetings than I've ever had in my life. I'm sure you are as well, as we try to sort of keep things going. And, I just felt like I had to get out. And so I just slipped out the, the door and, and just started on a walk around the neighborhood just to get a breath of fresh air and to talk to the Lord. And, and I was talking to the Lord and I was just telling him, Lord, this is a lot. This is too much, really. I mean, I, I even said something along the lines of, Lord, when I signed up and said yes to be a pastor, this is not what I had in mind, really. And just then I came around a corner and on the other side of this bush, I saw a sign that took my breath away. As I came around the corner walking, the sign said, victory is here. And of course, it was one of the thousands of signs that we created for people's front yards to help you invite your neighbors for the Easter service. And even though I was sitting at the table months ago when that concept was being arrived upon and our theme, Victory is Here, came about, in that moment, the sign was preaching to my soul, Victory is Here. And I heard the still small voice of the Holy Spirit say to my spirit, it is true, deep down you know, even though in this world you will have trials and tribulations, you know victory is here because Christ has come. And I sense the Spirit of the Lord say, even if you're, you're not going to be maybe able to gather the flock, all on the campus for the, all the festive Easter plans that we were forming and, you know, the truth still remains. Victory is here. And that leads to the second observation in our text. What did Jesus say at the end? He says, in this world you'll have trials and tribulations, trials and sorrows, but, I have overcome this world. That's our message. That's the gospel. That's our good news. That's what has always been the clarion call for believers, that Christ is risen and therefore victory is here. That despite 
our sinfulness, God in his great mercy and love showed grace to us. And he sent his only son to this earth to become one of us, to live the life of sinless perfection that none of us could live so that he would be fit and suitable to die the death of punishment as our replacement, as our substitute in our stead so that on the third day he could conquer the grave and proclaim to all the world, if you'll tether yourself to me by faith, you too will have victory. You too can have life, abundant now and everlasting hereafter. And so, although we don't know how long this season is going to last, daily it seems like it may last a little bit longer, we mustn't forget this second thing. Yeah, the world, trials and sorrows, but victory is here. Christ has won. He's the conqueror. And that's where our hope is. I wonder if you've trusted in him. Even during this service, my hope is that in the quietness of whatever living room or bedroom or den or patio you're sitting on and watching, that maybe you would say, I choose you, Jesus. I wanna ask you to come in and give me victory. Give me life. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And fill me full of your spirit so that I might have hope in my heart. So that I might have purpose in these days of spiritual darkness and fear. Choose Jesus. And take him. That's where the hope is which leads to one more thing I want to observe from our verse. Did you see the little phrase right in the middle? He says, in this world, or on this earth, you'll have trials and sorrows, but I have overcome this world. Therefore, right in the middle, what does he say? He says, so take heart. So be of good cheer. One translation puts it. What was Jesus saying to his disciples that night before he was going to the cross when he knew the weights on the bar, boys, are going to get really heavy from here on? Sorrows and trials. But remember, I've overcome. And so you can have hope. You can have cheer in your heart. That's what he was saying. Several nights ago, someone who many of you know and love phoned in from Washington, DC. It's Ben Stewart, longtime our youth pastor and teaching pastor here, now planting a church in Washington, DC. And I said, hey, what's up? It just needed to talk. I think, well, I think all of us pastors are needing to talk right now. And he downloaded some of what's going on in DC and how they're navigating it. And I tried to encourage his soul and speak to his situation as best I can understand it and give him uh, just that big brotherly word of encouragement. And, but then I flipped the script a little bit because typically there I might say, well, let me pray for you before we hang up. But still feeling a little heavy burden to myself, I said, Ben, I know you won't get to preach this Sunday because you can't meet in your theater and you don't have the technology and so you all are gonna tie into your mothership in Atlanta, Passion City, Atlanta, and Louis Giglio will preach and he'll do great, but..." I know that you would have a word and I need you to preach a word to me. Preach something to my soul right now. And he said, well, I will. 
he said, you know, I'm in First Thessalonians. And you know, the interesting thing about that, Ken, is you, as you read Paul is writing, he's saying, look, we, we've been through suffering. We've been treated outrageously in Philippi, and yet we moved forward. And we dared to tell you Thessalonians the gospel of Jesus in the face of strong opposition. Ben said, look at Paul's perseverance. Look at his boldness. By the time he gets to writing Corinthians, he'll have endured even more hardships. He'll have been beaten with rods. He'll be flogged with whips and pelted with stones and shipwrecked and hungry and thirsty and cold and naked. How did he keep going? Because Paul had the acute awareness that he was in God and that God through the indwelling presence of the risen Christ through his spirit was in him. He said, Ken, that's who we are as the believers. My heart was soft even as he was preaching that to me. He said, you know, it's true. We believers, we're people who have a different tank. We have a, we have a different gear. We believers, we have a different set of options than the rest of the world who has no hope because they have no Christ. Oh, we're no less shocked than they, but we who hope in Christ, we do have something they don't have. We've got that gear we can reach for through which we can access hope. We can be of good cheer even in the midst of it. And so he said, our message can't be to people just hunkered down, just hunkered down and, and ride it out because Christian virtue has always shined brightest in the midst of the darkest days. And so this is our moment. This is what we believers have been made for. And then he told me a, a great story about his own sister, Mandy. Maybe some of you remember Mandy. And um, she lives with her family in Alaska. And he said, Ken, the other night, when it was all just unraveling and panic was starting to break out across the land, she went over to the grocery store and she saw people racing through the grocery stores with way more than they needed stuff, their carts to fill the overflowing. And then Mandy, with a sensitive heart, looked over and she saw a, an older, smaller, international lady. He said she clearly just looked lost and confused, trying to figure out what do you do in this sort of circumstance. So she'd, she'd gathered up a couple of rolls of toilet paper and, and a few water bottles, but Mandy went over to her and, and she said to the elderly lady, could I help you? And the lady said, yes, I would appreciate that because sometimes you just can't hardly think straight and you don't really know. And so Mandy said, here, I'll help you. And they went through and got the things that she would need. And Mandy even helped her out to the car and helped get the bags into the car for her. And once they'd closed the door, that elderly international lady looked at Mandy and then just embraced her and said, I love you. And Mandy said, I love you too. Friends, as believers, this is our moment. So Jesus has seen fit to let an extra plate or two of weight go up on the bar, knowing that it's going to build character and perseverance and ultimately hope within us and he's given us the assurance never will i leave you never will i forsake you and so we're people who know 
we know this truth. We know that our Redeemer lives. We know that he has secured our ultimate victory. And that's why we are people with hope. So here on earth, you will have trials and sorrows, but I've overcome the world. Therefore, take heart. Jesus tells us, be of good cheer because you have me, you have all that you'll need and you will make it through this. Let's pray together. Lord, my hope and my prayer is that we would be found faithful in this season. It's not really the season that any of us signed up for. It still has many of us walking around a little bit in shock, kind of in a fog. And we've just never gone through anything like this, but it is helpful to remember that others have and other generations of different sorts, they've navigated their own problems. All the way back to the earliest believers who uh, had to fear for their lives. And even the greats like Paul and Peter would come to painful uh, ways of death, all for their faith. In this instance, Lord, we're, we're finding our faith tested, but uh, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to step forward, to remember who we are, to remember whose we are, to lean into that, to access that gear that we have that you've given to us. Won't you give us the grace, Jesus, to do that and to do it winsomely? For we pray it in your strong name, amen.